uh, we can uh, hand over. Do you want to hand over your Una? Yeah, I already did. Anastasia's presenter, and um, yeah, let's get started. So welcome everyone. Today's session is, I think, one that we all have been waiting for. No pressure, guys. It's SXA versus JSS, the ultimate snack that SmackDown. I feel a bit like I'm going to watch two parents fighting <laughs> in this case, <laughs> but let's see how it goes. I think you know everyone, these two fantastic characters. Those are Anastasia Flynn and Mark Van Alst, and I'm handing over this to you guys. Have fun. Thank you, Una. All right. Yeah, sound is working. <laughs> um, there we go. We have a special guest star. Are you ready? It's showtime. So yeah, welcome to JSS and SXA Ultimate Showdown. Yeah, welcome. Well, let's see how we can discuss JSS and SXA today. Our first challenger, the seasoned veteran, ready to drag and drop their opponents to the ground. Is SXA our next challenger, the feisty newcomer, backed by Jack's popularity and innovations of friend and frameworks. It is JSS. So we are um, uh, Psycho Evangelists. Mark is the SXA Evangelist, and I am the JSS Evangelist. So we both love our respective frameworks and um, we often talk about the values of each one and we're often asked by clients uh, which one should they choose which one is better and th that is one of the most popular questions so that is the purpose of this session do you have anything to add mark <laughs> before no, we jump into the battle <laughs> well, I think well, we might want to explain what the battle is about. Is so we have a few different rounds in which we're gonna discuss certain topics which are related both to SXA and JSS, and we're gonna see who wins uh, who wins uh, these rounds. And as you can see, we have a referee, our manager Jason. <laughs> yeah, the, the winner gets gets a bonus, right, Jason? <laughs> <laughs> Round one. All right. What you got, Mark? Component flexibility. Well, the first thing that comes to mind for me then is, uh, well, something which within SXA we call rendering variants. And, uh, well, let me show you a clip of what those variants can do. So rendering variants are different adoptions to your well, presentation components. So in this case, we're gonna add a page list component to our presentation. Uh, by default, it shows only the child items. So in this case, uh, an item with the name Scriven. And what we can do there is we can assign different data sources to that. So we're gonna use a different data source. In this case, a fruit folder, which uh, lives in this instance, which has all child items related to fruit. So we apply that data source. And then you'll see that we have a list of all the item names underneath that fruit folder. So how does that actually work? Well, we're using the default rendering variant. So if you now go back to our uh, content editor, we're going to look up that default rendering variant, which is stored within my site under the presentation node. There's an item called rendering variants. And we search for our uh, presentation component page list, and there is the default rendering variant, which in this case just uses a field title, so it renders the field the field title on this page, and it does that for every item uh, that's being uh, loaded into that component. So now, if you go back to our experience editor, we can also change those variations, so we can apply a different variation to that. So we have a thumbnail uh, with a title and a description. 
And then you can see that instantly the component changes. We're now uh, showing an image, a title, and a description. That is uh, because of the rendering variant. So as you can see here, we have different fields. We have a section which in uh, essence just renders a diff with a CSS class, title, description, or title desk. And we have a, a benefits field which renders the benefits or more or less a description of those fruits. Well, it's very impressive. <laughs> so Thank this you. round is this round is about the flexibility of components that come out of the box. And unfortunately, with JSS, we I could say that we have some components that come out of the box um, with the starter apps. There are some sample components that come in the style guide, but that'd be kind of stretching it a, a little bit. Um, those are just kind of just sample components. But we do have um, we do have a bunch of functionality that's inherited from the front end frameworks that's you know there in in JSS. And that is not a small thing to overlook. Um, the fr frameworks exist for for a reason. So we don't have to keep reinventing the, the wheel to solve common problems. For example, in React, um, just a few things to point out there. It gives us access to APIs for state management, um, for component composition, and that's a very important one that I'll come back to in a minute. Um, for encapsulation and reuse of generic behaviors that can be shared between your components and for validation. So we may not have the components out of the box, but we get a bunch of functionality out of the box. And um, that can that makes the components that we build very flexible. So here's, here's kind of, um, expanding more on component composition and why it's especially um, significant for 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 Sitecore um, applications. Um, it allows us to compose um, to to add extra um, It makes it easier to work with with Sitecore's poly inheritance model because normally it, 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 it components might only inherit from one other class, but when you use a component composition, you can compose multiple components together. So, for example, um, if if we look at this header container folder, so can you see my arrow? Okay, so by default, um, when the um, component factory runs and maps your um, JSS components to your cycle renderings, it only picks up what's in um, the folder name of your rendering and then uh, the index.js file underneath. Everything else is kind of there that's extra for you to use in your code, but it's not picked up by Sitecore. It doesn't count as a rendering. So my index is the entry point for my Sitecore rendering. So if I go to the, the entry point for the header container rendering, um, I can see that inside here, I'm actually, I'm pulling in additional components. I'm pulling in um, styled header container which is a CSS definition. So that's using a CSS and JS library to define component level styles. Then I'm pulling in an additional component here, um, background. So that does additional things. And then I co I'm combining all of that here and then returning the whole thing. Um, and this technique can also be applied to the JSS components. So for example, like when you import something like placeholder or link or image, you can comp 
compose that and wrap that in your own um, custom link or custom placeholder. So add extra features to the default out of the box components that come with GSS. So um, there's a, a, lots of opportunity for flexibility there. That's um, cool. <laughs> yeah. And to shoot back on your variant stuff, um, I, I try to see what it, would, what it would be like to implement variants in JSS. And I kind of, I was inspired by the component factory. Um, so, um, so we have a component called um, promo. And basically I, um, I, I made a bunch of variants of it. So there's, there's like a hero promo variant um, and you know, uh, like like same thing as you would do it in SXA, and um, they're just all in a sibling folder. And so there's one file that, um, like right right here. So this is exactly what the com the, the component factory in GSS does. It um, imports all of your components and then it creates a map of rendering names to um, React components. So that's what I'm doing here. So I can import all my variants and then um, in the main, in the index um, for the promo, which is what Sitecore is going to pick up, I can import that map. So I give my main component access to all my variants. And then um, for the user, I can give them a rendering parameter to, you know, to um, specify a variant. So they would um, set a variant, you know, in, in like as a, it could just be a string or a better way would be to make it a drop down from some pre-populated pre values. And then whatever that variant is, you would render that component. Um, and then if it's, you know, something that's not recognized, then you have a default implementation. So it, it doesn't let the user, you know, build the HTML the way you would do an SXA, but um, you, you could use the CSS and JS libraries to kind of modify styling of, of your components or kind of add maybe some animations to them, you know, like add slight variances to um, single components. So it's uh, a similar technique. So, yeah. Yeah, that's impressive. <laughs> cool. The promo component in JS. Oh. So yeah, you were talking a bit about styling and uh, well, adding CSS classes and things like that. Uh, well, there's something in, in SXA for that as well. So back to our page list component, if we click the paint bucket tool, then uh, we can apply CSS classes to customize our components, our renderings. So in this case, I'll just want to say that I want to align all the text uh, center. So what it does, it just adds a CSS class to that rendering, uh, which makes sure that, well, it's all being centered, all the text align is being centered. Um, if you go back to our container, which is a parent element of this promo component, then we can also set some background properties. So in this case, let's add some stripes to it. So click OK, instantly the component will reload and some stripes will be added. So the last thing that I wanted to talk about is the grid framework that we have in SXA. So by default, the page is divided in 12 columns. Um, so if our component needs to be uh, scaled, then we can do that by setting column width. In this case, we're gonna set the column width to six and we're gonna set, give it an offset of three. We could also choose to hide certain components based on uh, viewports, based on devices. So now you can see that our component uh, has reduced in size and is centered um, since we are setting it uh, off by three columns. The last thing I wanna do is I wanna, well, trim this list a bit down. Um, it uses five, uh, it uses a lot of items and we only wanna show five items. So I'm gonna set the page size to this list to five items. And then you'll see that our list has uh, quite quickly uh, shrunken. And well, all of that without 
one line of code. Going to the next topic, there's one thing that I wanted to point out as well, is something that you could do in SXA, which you cannot do in the platform itself. Um, that's personalization on field level. So going back to our page list component and our rendering variant, um, we can select fields within our rendering variants and we can apply rules to those fields. So there's a section called rules and then th those fields will only be enabled when the uh, personalization rules are being met. So in this case, we're just gonna uh, do it easy. We're gonna show the image uh, based on the item name. So we're gonna set the item name equals to, uh, in this case, Apple. And then if all goes well, the only item that has a, a picture in this uh, component should be the Apple. So hit okay. We'll save our uh, rendering variant and then we'll reload our page in the experience editor. And as you can see, now only our item which has uh, the name Apple shows the actual picture. The others here are just ignoring that. So that picture and that HTML is not being rendered to the browser itself. So those are just some out of the box options that you have with SXA to customize your, uh, your components. Well, I said that talking about the style guide would be kind of stretching it, but I do want to talk about it because the I, I want to talk about it in, in the context of the starter apps and that there it's not just style guide with some sample components. This the JSS starters are fully loaded. Um, so and they are they are very flex um they allow a lot of flexibility because a lot of the scripts um that um add the the customizations to jss that differentiated from just the native front end um, framework applications are there in your app and are controlled by you and a lot of people um that i talk to seem to overlook these starters and um they just get in there and they Strip, strip out all of the stuff that's you know that comes with them, or maybe they just already have your own pre-built starters with that stuff stripped out. But I really encourage everybody, even who's been working with with JSS for a while, to go back and look at those starters more closely. For example, um, in the in the JSS um, in the React starter in the style guide. You, you can see how um, not only does it give a sample implementation of every field, but in the um, in the navigation, there's several sections of patterns. So there are um, some best practices that it, it gives you. Um, it it show it, it it talks about the the difference between working with the broad level fields and component level fields. Um, it talks about tracking, multilingual patterns. This is definitely where all front end devs should be starting and reading through as a supplement to the docs. Um, and so the the solution itself, so what I would recommend um, at, as a starting point for understanding all the flexibility and customization points is going to this this server, JS file in the server folder because this is the entry point for the server side rendering build. Um, so this file, uh, this file is used by Webpack um, as the, the entry point. So this is this is what pulls in all of the all of the customizations that that are needed to make JSS work. And so um, you can see that. Um, we um we are pulling in like not just some npm modules but there's also some some custom stuff here coming from the project there's um a a a, a custom Gra graphql um script and if we look at look in there we'd see that um we're we're initializing the apollo client with some cache settings 
So, and since it's in your solution that can be modified, um, we have a, a custom initialization of the internationalization um, module um, and we're, um, we're passing in um, a default language and we're also making it, 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 it compatible with a specific URL pattern that um, is specific to Sitecore. So that also can be customized. Um, JSS has its own custom um, routing implementation. Um, so, it, you know, because um, the way JSS does routing is not how normal SPAs do routing. Um, it's, it's since it has to work with, you know, the page model of, of a CMS. So there is additional magic that's done in this route handler file right here. Um, but all of, I mean, it can be customized or, or updated as well. Um, so these are like these three, these four folders are your core foundation for JSS functionality and they can be updated. Um, and even things like what the code looks like when you generate a, a component that can be updated. Um, yeah. Oh, and um, if the the component factory generation code that could be updated too so if you're unhappy with the um with uh the the out of the box um file system structure for your source code and you want to change that then um you, you would update the, the component factory this one here um to make changes to that so the the solution is very flexible in in how things are set up and the um, the Webpack config that builds everything and bundles everything is is here. So even that can be changed, and additional loaders it, it can be added if you want to support new file types or if you want to add TypeScript to your project or something like that. That's cool. <laughs> so. This is a summary of our battle. Yeah, well, for the first round, right? Uh, round one. Yeah. Most of it no, comes no, with out of the box, as I say, JSS, using the JSS style guide as an example, uh, using, well, standard as I say, functionality like variants. Uh, yeah. We'll have to see what Jason thinks at the end. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, we'll find out. Let's continue with the next round then. Round two, custom components. Hmm. So now we're moving on from out of the box to customizations. Yeah. Fight. All right, what you got? Well, I got this little diagram here. Um, I found it on the documentation site. Um, I think it's actually a, a process in which uh, Adam started at one point, kind of his thought process when to create a new component. The uh, biggest benefit of SXA, but also uh, the biggest issue with SXA probably is that there are so many things that you can customize. Uh, <laughs> so whether it's a small change in just applying a CSS class, whether it's building new components or using existing components as your examples, um, it is really, if you leave out all these uh, options and you know, you'll see the, the choices that you have, I think there are nine different options already here uh, that kind of outline, that, that they're kind of given the direction of what you could do uh, with SXA. So have you ever run into a case where you couldn't customize something? Uh, no, honestly, mm -hmm. I haven't. Um, and even if you look at SXA, they, all, they made it quite easy. So, for example, if you want to add a component if, in rendering, there's this component wizard that you can use. Um, so you can give it a name, uh, you can add it to a, a certain module that you have already created, uh, apply classes in the, in the outer wrappers, provide the source to a, a, a razor view, set options for data sources, like do you want to ask the user uh, to supply a data source or create a new one? 
uh, what sort of rendering templates do you want to use? We have uh, support for, uh, for rendering parameters. So is there a base that you want to inhabit from? And we can apply different behaviors to our module. So does it need to have a background image or things like that? Um, it will instantly create all the stuff in Cycle for you. You'll still need to do some uh, customizations as to the c -sharp code for that. The other uh, nifty feature that we have is uh, if you go into the settings node, uh, then we can insert new modules. Uh, so what is a module? Um, a module essentially is a combination of different renderings. And a module is being added to your site by using scaffolding, which you just saw in the page content. And scaffolding uh, really explains all the steps that are needed to insert that module to your component. So in this case, uh, I'm gonna add a new module or I'm gonna present I'm gonna add a new module to a folder outside of my SXA folders. And I can give uh, uh, the options whether it's a tenant module or a side module or both. So do they do these modules need to be in, uh, well, developed or installed uh, whenever you create a new site or whenever you create a new tenant. So all of those, well, handy features like those wizard, they're just, well, out of the box Sitecore. And um, essentially the, the, the hardest thing that you can do with SXA is building a custom component and building a custom po component that more or less just equals building your traditional Sitecore components, building your traditional controller renderings and adding them to Sitecore, but now in a more or less a different way uh, of adding them to Sitecore. It's not just registering a uh, rendering, no, it's also the process uh, behind that. So how does that rendering will be made available to the end user? Yeah, so I, for the interest of time, I I will not show a demo um, of, of using open source third-party components. I did a demo at the last SUCCON. Um, so I recommend people watch that where I um, used several frameworks, um, an animation framework, a UI um, a structure framework, um, and of course, um, style components to build out a search interface um, where the the tiles kind of fly in. Um, and, it, and so from my side of, of customization, I mean, it, you have to build it yourself, um, but you have <laughs> you have to uh, like you know search and and pull in these library these libraries yourself. But there's infinite amounts of third party um, libraries and components <laughs> available, and you know like, sure some of them are just off the cuff. Um, small little libraries that may not be updated and they're kind of shady and you probably don't want to use them. But I mean, like React is m made by Facebook. Like they put in millions of dollars into this. Like, so if they have a, a, a utility package to help you or, you know, like somebody from their core team is putting something out that has millions of downloads a week and it's regularly updated, like, it's, you know, and in, all the dependencies are up to date. That's pretty trustworthy. So really, you're using the Facebook card, huh? So yes, like look into what you're using and make sure it's reliable and then it's updated and it's maintained. But it, but there's so many options available. Um, uh, the, it, there's even um, a Bootstrap version of React that you know it, it doesn't actually use. Um, jQuery like regular bootstrap it's it's just react components made to look like bootstrap so if you know if you're uh, porting a site over that used to use bootstrap you don't have to build rebuild that it's it's already there available for you okay um, you got me and, and a lot of these libraries use props to um, to let you customize how the components act or look, um, you know, props that you pass into your components. And with JSS, um, fields and rendering parameters are props that you pass into your components. So all these libraries are just so perfect for using in, in CMSs um, because like whatever the content author uh, specifies as a field or a rendering parameter, like that's 
what can flow right into your um, your components um, and your third party components. And then of course I have to mention the component composition here again because that's just one more way to to customize stuff. Ah, uh, we can do that too. Yeah. All right. Round three, multi-site Oof. <laughs> <laughs> can I hide for this round? You can try. Fight. Yeah, what's there to say, right? As I say, multi-site, it's... Uh, those two are kind of made for each other. Um, the SSA platform uses tenants and sites. Um, so tenants are more or less isolated containers, contains all sorts of information like the, the content, the presentation, settings, uh, the, the site settings itself. So which host name does it need to resolve to, things like that. Um, we have security roles for tenants. We have security roles for sites. Uh, well, I said you, well, we have a site manager even to, uh, to look at the site properties uh, like the host name and things like that. Uh, so yeah, I think for SXA, uh, yeah, multi site, yeah. Yeah, we got it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> next slide, next slide, please. <laughs> yeah, so without SXA, um, multi site um, in, in in JSS is kind of sad. Um, it's it's not very straightforward. So in order to create multiple sites, you have to create um, a, and a, a separate apps for each site, um, so, which is, is separate JSS projects to, um, so, and so it's, it's, it's hard to share code. And e even though once you switch over to Sitecore First workflow, there's nothing stopping you from then sharing templates and um, renderings across sites. From the code perspective, um, each app only sees its own scope. So that's what makes multi-site um, so difficult with just vanilla JSS. Um, so yeah, and And even yeah, they they de deploy to like separate uh, to separate folders. So even like re referencing the the components from one site to another kind of requires some some customizations. So what you can do um, if you are in that situation and you have to do um, multi-site with vanilla Java uh, JSS, there's kind of two approaches that I've seen. Um, one, uh, I, we call it the mono repo. So it's exporting, yeah, so you still do um, each site as its own project, but then you export all the common components into NPM, NPM packages. Um, I have a blog post about how to um, how to do that. Um, so then all of your projects can just import that shared, you know, those shared e e components. So um, there's a a JavaScript library called Lerna for managing mono repos. That's actually what JSS uses. So here's kind of what the sample structure would look like. So all your your projects would be um, siblings. So um, you like site. So all your sites, all your apps would be siblings, and then your shared components would be siblings, and then your um, you know Lerna would just build everything. Um, you know, you would run build once, um, and er everything would be built individually by by Lerna. So that kind of what makes management manageable. Um, and then you import the um, the shared stuff from 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 that project. Um, the other option is um, something I call the mono tree. Um, it's basically um, moving the 
reassigning the GSS app root item template one level higher than what it normally is. So normally it would be um, at this site level, but it if you actually make the content item um, the app template and and so then all of the sites that that you create underneath it could be managed by um, one single code base. So the the customization that you would have to do here is that you would have to manually send back the site context with every request, since that's not, you know, th this is not out of the box and the code wouldn't, the layout service wouldn't know which site you're talking about. This is you, Mark. Yeah, this is a small uh, small demo of uh, how to do multi-site within SXA. As I said, it's it's more than out of the box. Um, in this case, I have the Style Guide website, a uh, website which I created and open sourced uh, a few weeks ago. You can find it on GitHub on my account. Um, and we have some example sites in there as well. They all live in the same tenant. Uh, they're just separated by groups. So I made a separate group for those other sites. Um, as you can see, there are three sites. If I click the home item of the example one site, um, then you'll see that I'm reusing um, some presentation components that I had to find on my uh, style guide site. So the header and the footer in this case, I made a different promo component for the uh, global virtual SACON, which is uh, the promo that's being shown there. And as I said, I can still reuse the page designs and parts designs from my other sites and even the whole theme. So my theme is also the style guide theme. So now let's add an other component to this page by drag and dropping. And then you'll see that I can select my uh, existing components as well. So my existing data source are also available within my site, even my rendering variants, because the default variant doesn't really work well with this logo. Let's use a different one. And now you see that I can use or reuse the content that I have on my other sites as well. In this dialogue, you'll see that there are two sites in this case, the current site, which has just one promo, the second promo, and my other promos from my style guide website. So going back to the experience editor. Now let's have a look at site number two, which is uh, a completely different site. Um, so it doesn't use any of the components uh, from the other sites, but it might seem a bit familiar. Uh, it's the JSS site, whereas JSS stands for just simple SXA or just standard Sitecore, uh, but that's for you to decide obviously. And as you can see, you can use multiple sites and uh, you can create your own sites, your own look and feels. You can, you can make them isolated. These just uses some components, some container components, some promo components. And I also have my third website. If I go back to the experience editor, my That's third website, website. Sorry, it's a, it's a cloned website, the, the cloned version of uh, example number two, but then just applying a different theme. So now I'm using the JSS dark theme, which just applies some different CSS to my uh, to my website. And you can see that we can reuse the same content, the same structure, and still give it a bit of a, well, different uh, look and feel. Then there's this toolbox. This toolbox uh, has the SXA site manager. And in this site manager, you'll be able to, well, make some changes to the properties of your site. So uh, with SXA, we moved the configuration uh, from for your sites from, uh, well, being configuration files on this to configuration within Sitecore. And this tool allows you to see how Sitecore interprets all those changes. And then last thing that I wanted to point out is on tenant level, you can decide which, which sites are being shared. So in this case, all my data from my style guide site is shared. Uh, but you can also think of situations where you could host different sites. So let's say that you use a non-public website just for data distribution. So your uh, content authors will manage all the data in there. A separate website for all your presentation components. So your marketers can set up their uh, components there, do all their, uh, well, their NFT uh, call to actions, define them there, and then have their uh, webmasters use those call to actions on their sites. There are so many different ways that you can utilize this infrastructure, uh, but it's, uh, it's there for you. Okay. I think you won this round. <laughs> yeah, you think? 
Yay! <laughs> yeah, so TLDR, GSS is sad without SXA when it comes to multi-site governance. <laughs> All right. Yeah, and as I say, as I said, it, it's built for it. It's built for hosting yeah. websites, right. moving tenants, uh, utilize all sorts of standard cycle stuff, but then just taking it one step further. So I think we quickly need to move Time to the next. Time to market. This is an interesting one. I hope. Fight. What you got? There we go. Well, I've got this little diagram. I think people have probably seen it already a few times. Um, and it really speaks to uh, how SXA changes your time to market. And I'm not saying that SXA will uh, reduce it by uh, two thirds or whatsoever. And I'm not saying that this is the structure uh, or the process that you need to follow. But we're in, tra we're in traditional development, cycle development, you normally follow a linear process. Uh, with SXA, you can customize it a bit more to your, uh, well, to your setting. Uh, for instance, content entry is something that can happen uh, way earlier than, uh, uh, well, in the past. Um, as soon as you have a basic and a decent structure of your pages and, and uh, let's say like half of the components are already there, you can already start filling those components with data. You can feed the actual uh, content into those components, making it the actual uh, proper test data as well for your developers. Uh, so there's, there's, yeah, again, it's very flexible and there's no way that we, uh, there's, there's not like a, a default way that we are advising. Um, the same goes for uh, UX design. Sure, you can do UX design within SXA. There's a, there's a wireframing tool in there, uh, but it's not a hard requirement whatsoever. You can decide yourself, do you want to use that or do you, do you don't want to use that? Do you still want to uh, stick with your own uh, implementation? I think in general, if you look at SXA, then there are uh, like four steps that we advise you to take when implementing SXA sites. First step being defining. So what are your goals? Are you do you have multiple sites? Is there a need to share content and design? Um, what's the requirement of your customer? Then we go into the design phase. So uh, what we would recommend is uh, like aligning the UX and, and uh, designers and encourage SXA out of the box components, uh, but not making not forcing those components uh, up on them it's really a matter of explaining to them how SXA works what it is what are components what are rendering variants so that they can take those things into account when designing the actual website uh, this will prevent uh, any issues later on in the in, uh, in the whole process where you end up with a design which you cannot completely build uh, with out-of-the-box components or build at all um, then there's this analyze phase. The, here we would recommend that you do a, like a gap analysis uh, with your uh, well with your design and uh, with all of the SXA uh, features in, in the SXA toolset. So what are the things that you need to build yourself? Can you use uh, the components for uh, certain elements? Do you you use rendering variants for that? Could you use the SXA search features and all of that, those things? Or are there any things that you need to do yourself? Do you need to build your own custom components or your, are there any well, pipelines perhaps that you might need to introduce or whatsoever of third party data? And well, finally it starts, it, then the fun starts, right? That's implementing, like building your page layouts and renderings. And once you have finally defined a, a basic structure, uh, well then your content entries or your content authors can also start feeding uh, your implementation with actual data that you can use to test all of your components therefore reducing the risk of issues later on. So I think you're saying know your components and design with the SXA components in mind instead of de designing first and then finding out that they don't fit what's out of the box. And that's yeah, how exactly. you take time and get yeah. um, to market fastest. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. I think we've been in those situations before when we were the de well, developers or sales agencies. Yeah. So I'm not even going to try to fight this one because, yeah, just um, SXA is clearly the choice that um, customers should take if time to market is the most important thing to them. Um, JSS is faster time to market than custom MEC since it does um, have um, so many pre-configurations uh, pre out of the box. Um, it already has the build process set up for you. Um, things like that. Um, 
uh, you know, how how to handle bundling CSS, how to handle bundling JavaScript, um, getting that that initial import with the site, um, the, you know, site structure set up. Um, so it it, it, it kind of sets the foundation for you. So that speeds it up a little bit. But I mean, it's nothing. It's not even close to what SXA has with its um, drag and drop. Um, you know, build a site in just a few minutes. Um, we do have um, uh, some uh, some accelerators um, and um, some modules that have been built by the community that are open source and free to use. Um, like for example, there's an, an an open source commerce accelerator, so that can also help you um, accelerate your 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 project and increase your time to market. All right. Oh, External data integration. Last round. Okay, there we go. Hey guys, just to know you're slightly over your time. Uh, you're cutting into your Q and A time. Yes. Okay. No Q and A. All right. So for external, um, I'll start at this one. So J JSS has multiple options for how to get external data um, how to integrate with external data so the slide wasn't updated <laughs> so there's a utility function in um in the core jss module um for um for for fetching data so um there's the 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 main JS um, the main JS, JSS npm package has a whole bunch of utility functions. Um, so if you don't know about them, um, go inspect the source code of 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 that um, npm package. And so there's like there's there's functions for just calling the lay um, calling the layout service for calling the custom JSS media handler. Um, um, there's uh, like a, 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 a Apollo fetch, um, you know, there's a lot of helpful things. So if you want to go and fetch external data from your JavaScript layer, uh, you don't, you know, like there's, there, there's already some utility functions available for you. Um, you can inject um, data into your, your layout service um, from the back end um, with, um, with custom content resolvers. And there's a lot of blog posts out there um, that show how to do this. Um, I think I'll just post a bunch of those after this presentation. And uh, um, the docs cover also how to stitch um, GraphQL schemas. So if you're using GraphQL in your project, you can um, have your schema and then an external schema. And then from the perspective of your app, it's just, it, it doesn't know that you know there's two different da data sources um, and there's a blog post out there about um, using content hub in JSS so apparently that's a thing so I will include <laughs> that with, um, with my references okay so for the sake of time I'll uh, I'll just resume my uh, external data integration part in three words just standard Sycor. <laughs> Uh, use anything that you want, the data exchange framework, Psycho Connect, whatever, it's just Psycho. And I think we will skip my part of the demo as well as I was showing a data exchange framework integration um, with a Great job. RSS feed. So Jason thinks we tied at flexibility that I want custom components that SXA wins at time to market, and what was three? Multi-site. Yes, of course. And that I win. Uh, JSS wins at, um, at at integration. Mm, I'll talk to him and I'll one on one soon. <laughs> What's happening? Huh? What's this? What you do? Uh oh. <laughs> Huh? What's this? The oh. challenges are teaming up. Incredible. Well, 
Yes. Everybody assumes that you have this Greenfield project when they, and so they just want to compare features, or at least salespeople do. But that's not usually the case, is it? You're usually coming from, you're up, upgrading a previous project. <laughs> uh, you either have a legacy MVC project or a legacy um, front end framework project, and you want to now come to Sitecore. And so, what do you do, JSS or SXA? And so, in this case, uh, yeah, we think we work best together. <laughs> right, Mark? Yeah, I totally agree. I was waiting on Jason to say something. <laughs> yeah, I think it's best if you, um, well, given the different requirements. Uh, it would serve best if uh, JSS and SSA can work together so you can, uh, well, leverage the best of both worlds in that sense. Um, you can yeah. use JavaScript apps within an SXA instance and uh, govern them with SXA. Uh, we have made it possible in a, a, a experimental way that you can share content between uh, SXA sites and SXA uh, JSS sites within tenants. I mean, and I'm not sure if we have, I don't think we have time now to show that anymore. We'll um, show it. <laughs> well, yeah. unfortunately, you are out of time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. No. Okay. So we'll uh, we'll post that in a, in a in a blog post and in a separate video, uh, and then uh, get back to that. Yeah, and all of Jason's outtakes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and bloopers, please, if you have them. Well, that's yeah. Yeah, so, we can give you behind the scenes. <laughs> so to summarize, to quote Cam Figgy quoting a meme, quoting an Australian girl talking about Mexican tacos, why not both? <laughs> Um, and I think so, with that. Yeah, so we, um, you shouldn't judge um, when you're making recommendations to your clients, you shouldn't go by the feature set or, you know, who has more pros and cons, but you should evaluate the, the, the business case. And um, uh, very rarely is it necessary to go fully custom, only if they're already on a cust uh, on an MVC platform. Um, and then they're or they're leveraging a custom accelerator. Um, other than that, it's really most uh, they should be going JSS with SXA or SXA. Um, and here are the business needs. Um, that's it. All right. Thank you, guys. I will need to. Uh, yeah, oh, great question slide. Thank you. Uh, we actually do have several questions. So the question number one. Uh, will there be a JSS tenant container in the future where we can create multiple sites and use the same JSS code base? Uh, that exists today. When 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 you create a JSS tenant, um, when you when you're using JSS and SXA and you create a, J a JSS tenant um, and you deploy your code, it deploys to the tenant level. So it's shared by all the sites under that tenant. Thank you. Uh, then we have the next one. I only seem to see examples and talks on JSS using React and not Vue.js or Angular. Would you say that the community seems to be varying more to JSS with React? And do you think this might mean Sitecore focuses solely only, only re on React, like we've seen with Sitecore Forms updates recently? Um, React is more popular in general, not just in the Sitecore world, but if you just look at the NPM downloads, React is uh, exponentially more used. Um, and it, it's just a coincidence that I'm the JSS evangelist and I only know React. <laughs> but um, Sitecore, um, as far as the dev team, um, they, they, care about feature parity, um, but it, it is an open source project. So um, it, it is possible that, you know, pull requests are accepted that don't support all features. Um, but if, if that happens, then, you know, it just goes in the, in the backlogs. Thank you. Uh, 
we are quite short of time, but let's do quickly two more. Is there a reason to use SXA if you plan to do a lot of custom components? I, I think this is pretty much self-explanatory, but I will let Mark answer that. Uh, yeah, well, well, it will totally depend on your on your use case, right? If you are using uh, custom components, what does that say about using the amount of sites? Do you have multiple sites in there? Do you need to share content presentation within those sites? Like building custom components in that sense, it's it's not any different for SXA than it is for uh, for traditional sidecore. So that it's on itself, I don't think that should be a reason. Uh, and there, I think there are always components within the SXA toolbox that you can leverage on any site that you build, whether it's just a simple text component or, or a very flexible promo component. Uh, and perhaps you can even build your custom components within SXA just by using a, uh, a snippet, by using composite components and things like that. Based on what I've seen Mark build, I, I think if you're building a lot of custom components, you may not be like... you. you you may not be utilizing all of SXA's features, um, but I don't know, I need to see the use case. But yeah, like SXA is really flexible. Okay, and a short one with the answer yes or no. Will Sidecore speak future versions use JSS? I have no idea. <laughs> okay. I, don't, I don't think so, to be honest. I'm not percent sure. I've not heard, yeah. Okay, guys, we are completely out of time. Thank you very yeah, much for finding the time. <laughs> no worries. Good presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thanks for all your effort, guys. Anytime. Because, obviously. <laughs> Well, as you can see, so far we have raised 3,578 euros. So please donate. It is the fund to the United Nations, the Global Solidarity for the COVID-19 Response Fund. So every bit matters and we're all in this together. So the next session that we have is just a second, is demo of Sitecore Content Hub's role in Sitecore personalization. And it will be presented by Minjay Kim and Blair Rabok. So that one is coming up next in four minutes. Hey, um, Min, can you share your screen in the meantime? I just made you the presenter. Yeah, sure thing. Mike, where'd you go?